So welcome back here. Today we're going to be looking at Kant's essay, Idea for a Universal History with a Cosmopolitan Purpose. And so the first thing we want to do is kind of assess, you know, what, what's the problem for Kant's essay? What's the problem that he's dealing with here? And really we're looking at I think the problem is whether or not it's possible for a construction of a, of a philosophic history, as, as Kant's going to say, um, which is something that's going to be a project that's going to be taken up by people much later than him. Maybe it will start uh, with Fichte a little bit when he has his addresses to the German nation. And then definitely we're going to see Hegel doing this. And then thereafter, the kind of Hegelian school is very historical. But uh, the, the big thing is that at this time, this is something Hegel echoes, but something Kant seems to just kind of beginning to catch on to. At the time, history is one of the more objective sciences. It's supposed to be, you know, recollecting facts, whereas the philosophers are just, um, they're kind of spouting theories. Historical work is the work of empirical science. However, there's an antagonism here because this is kind of unsatisfactory to us. For for one, if if we just have a rote recollection of facts, there is no general structure or or themes that we're allowed to see, uh, which repeat in history. And so we we can't confer anything. We can't infer anything from history because to do so would make it subjective or almost mystical in some sense. And if this is true, history really is uh, dead in the past, right? Which calls into question, what exactly can we learn from history? What what can history actually tell us? I think today, a lot of the times you hear the phrase, um, you know, we need to learn from history's mistakes. But to in, if to endorse a scientific historical method uh, is to admit no structure or narrative to history, then we can really doubt the value of recounting these truths in the first place. So Kant is trying to exposit uh, a philosophic history, which is not, he says in the end, actually, in the ninth proposition, this is not a history proper, but it's an a priori structure by which we are going to have some idea where humanity is going. What are the, what are the kind of moving principles? Hegel's going to talk about this idea of a world soul. And I think this is a really good starting point because if we think about a soul in, in the classical sense, uh, you go through Plato and Aristotle, um, maybe you could look at the at the Phaedo uh, as evidence of this. The soul for Plato is just um, this, the thing that separates the living thing from the dead thing, right? We look at a living thing and we're like, okay, what separates it from a dead thing? What, what organizes its parts? And then with Aristotle, we're going to talk about it being act, the actuality of, of the body, right? Or the, oh, I'm sorry, the form of the body. So it's there, the soul is a kind of moving principle. And so I think Kant here is kind of beginning to interrogate the question of looking at a world soul in the sense of what are the principles by which history is going to proceed? And the hope, as he's going to say in the end, this is, I guess this is kind of looking at the end, but the hope is that this will somehow uh, lead to a kind of universal history to see both a view of its end and to instruct us now in a sense, you know, to liberate us from the past, to show that the past has been refuted by the present, but then also in showing the past as a kind of evanescent moment of present consciousness, uh, we are given hope for what we can accomplish in the future. So those, I think, maybe that's uh, my way of starting off what we're going to look at here. Oh, I was muted there. Yeah, no, that, that's <laughs> yes. fantastic. That's fantastic. We're going to try to hit on on every one of those points. Um, the only things I would add on to that is that, yeah, what this essay really speaks to is the task which the Enlightenment thinkers set for themselves, which is this idea that we could attain to a universal theory of history um, that as a retrospective explains the, the logic of history in the past. Um, but that also might give us some clues as to the future, where we might yet still go. And of course, it's this task, this this the notion that this could even be possible is intimately bound up with a belief in human perfectibility, which was so pervasive during this time um, that 
in bourgeois society, as we said last uh, in our last video, bourgeois society people attain an understanding of society, which says that we have always constituted our own mode of existence. We're constantly producing it and reproducing it. And if this is the case, we might be able to reflect on how we have done this and how we might still do it. And so the result is that we might perfect the social order. And for Kant, this means attaining to a just constitution of society and a just constitution of the relations between states. And one thing we will be getting to, I'm certain, is the difference between quantitative and qualitative change, what that means, what the difference between them is, um, and how perhaps Kant breaks from the Aristotelians and previous ways of thinking about this change and society and man's place in society. Yeah. And so that, yeah. And one yeah. last thing I would just say, sorry, by way of introduction, um, we've uh, we've tasked ourselves with not just throwing around Hegel quotes today. It's probably still going to happen regardless. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll start us off with one that's, that's always very good. What Kant is doing here is what Hegel says in the his lecture on the philosophy of history, which is that to him who looks at the world rationally, the world in turn presents a rational aspect. And so that is what Kant is doing and what we're interested in is uh, discovering perhaps the rationality of history. Yeah. Um, and you said yourself, the point is not to be mystical. The point is not simply to point out uh, thematic repetitions, which people love to do. For instance, the United States being the Roman Empire, being right. in a phase of Roman decline, so on. You get that a lot with uh, Oswald Spengler as well, who is kind of uh, resurged in popularity um, in, on the conservative right, online and in real life. So we don't want to be mystical, um, but we are interested in this the notion of a universal history. So that's that's all I would say. Yeah, and just uh, again as a rejoinder, I think I touched on this. Kant is going to make it very clear, just so that there is no illusions when we start out. Kant is very clear: philosophic history is not meant to replace the science of you know the empirical science of history. When we get into Hegel, you might be able to to genuinely question. You know, Hegel probably sees his rendition of history as actually replacing the practice of empirical history, um, in the sense that. He thinks he is at a time when he is able to kind of tie history together into a to a coherent story. Kant, Kant's not there. He's not in that position. And philosophic history, once again, it work. This is going to work as a lot of Kant, right? Um, where he's looking at setting a priori structures up. So, you know, how are we meant to? What what are the kind of antecedents to the way you know human nature is going to function? He's looking at these kind of almost meta-historical question. So he's not saying that, oh, look, we have a universal history for a cosmopolitan view. It's over, right? No, he's not warding off empirical inquiry or the science of actually kind of presenting history in, in a compelling way. Quite to the contrary, right? He just, uh, he, he wants to find out kind of, you know, systematic structures, which is I think, uh, you know, an interesting proposition that we're going to see and one that's almost in a sense instrumental to kind of the way the uh, the liberal order or the enlightenment order sets itself up as. But um, without further ado, I think it's it's probably best if we don't go proposition by proposition. For reference, there are uh, nine propositions to this essay. A lot of them seem to jump around, but a lot of them are unified, I think, by various arguments. Um, and so if we if we were to just go through each of them, we would find ourselves coming back to themes that are you know tied in in later ones. And I think it would be kind of chaotic in a way. But the first thing I wanted to to look at here, which is, um, all right, we set up this division, uh, right? When we, we look at world history, we were asking, what are the principles of world history? And first, immediately, we're confronted with how are we even to regard world history as having principles? How are we to regard the world as having principles? And there's a difference here, I think, between, uh, you know, this is something that Hegel points out as well. There's a difference between the world and nature. And so, so Kant says here, um, 
Uh, let us now see if we can succeed in finding a guiding principle for history and then leave it to nature to produce someone capable of writing it along the lines suggested. Thus, nature produced a Kepler who found an unexpected means of reducing the eccentric orbits of planets to definite laws, a Newton who explained these terms in a universal natural cause. And so nature then, this is, I guess, an important concept to get at the end. Nature is not just uh, the sum of a group of individuals or a group of animals or rocks or ecosystems. It's a system and systems are governed by laws, I think, right? Um, this is a, I think Hegel has a really succinct way of saying it, which which really helped me understood. And this is ironically from his lectures uh, on the philosophy of religion, but here I'll say, he says, quote, by the term world, however, we understand the aggregate of material things, the collection merely of that infinite number of existing things, which are actually visible, in each of which is, to begin with, conceived of as existing for itself. The world embraces men equally with natural things. When the world is thus taken as an aggregate, and even as an aggregate merely of natural things, it is not conceived of as nature by which we understand something which is in itself a systematic whole, a system of arrangements and gradations, and particularly of laws. The term world, as thus understood, expresses the aggregate merely and suggests that it is based simply on the existing mass of things and thus has no superiority, no qualitative superiority, at least, over material things. And so if nature is a system, Systems are governed by laws. And I think there's a kind of discernible transcendental argument going on here, right? Just as our perception of the world conforms to universal categories of understanding, um, so does the viewing of nature conform to universal laws, whether this is kind of Kepler's laws or uh, Newton's laws and, and gravity. And so in that sense, Nature has a telos. There's this is a teleological theory. It has some kind of uh, some kind of ordering principle to it. Um, so that's kind of the first thing that I that I wanted to to set out. Though how how is nature supposed to have it? So nature is a, just a system, and I think in that sense Kant is not just saying, ah, uh, well, nature has laws, right? It's like we observe these uh, these laws in nature. Uh, precisely because it has, to, you know, for there to be in nature, there must be these laws, right? So it's a again a very transcendental way of, of arguing about this. These these laws are antecedents, and so then when we're here, we're left to just kind of parse through these laws. That's why you know for someone like Kant, the idea now in in recent maybe uh, you know theories of the brain where they talk about human pattern recognition skills, the reason. Uh, that this would be, you know, of course, obvious to someone like Econ or even Aristotle, where they talk about, yeah, of course, we have pattern recognition, right? It's our, our perception of the world by nature depends on these laws. So I think that is really the argument that's going on here. But uh, do you have, is there anything else on that? Yeah. So, I mean, he he tackles this in his first thesis or proposition in, the, yeah. um, in this essay. Um, it's the basic assumption here. It's a teleological assumption, and he gives a fairly straightforward example, which is the inward structure of organisms, right? Organs are um, positioned, they're arranged towards certain ends. Um, it would be contradictory, um, maybe even inconceivable, of a useless organ. Um, useless organs are um, discarded, right? They don't they don't achieve their ends. Organs have ends. And so, as, as I think he puts it this way later on in the essay, why would we assume a, a teleology of the particular and not of the whole? We assume a teleology when we look at the, the outward form and inward structure of animals, as he says. Um, the higher up we go, then we arrive at a teleology of history itself. So... Just one thing that I think is where uh, goes with saying is that this is not a new theory. <laughs> um, this is in a very well tradition that you can trace back to 
uh, you know, like Ptolemaic cosmology, medieval cosmology, uh, in a sense, applied these kind of principles of motion. And of uh, if, if you look at kind of the writings of Ptolemy or people around this time, uh, you know, the planets, the heavenly spheres, they move in such a way that is ordered according to uh, the intellects of the spheres. So each lower sphere is able to intellectually apprehend the moving or the perfection of the higher sphere and thus moves in a circle according to observing this perfection because circular motion is an unending motion. It's a kind of perfect motion. But yeah, just, you know, you can find a lot of uh, Kant's not, Kant, this is not, you know, new. Uh, this is not an individual Kant argument. This is well within a tradition. And so I think that is worth bearing in mind that Kant is not just making this out of nowhere. And there's a lot to contend with, you know, if we did want to, uh, you know, we're not trying to look at evolution, how this, but there's a long history to it, right? There's a very long history to this kind of teleological theory of the universe or of cosmology. So just bears with saying, but yeah, I think um, uh, one, one of the next things that I, that I wanted to, to talk about was um, he immediately goes in to the idea of, all right, well, nature has some moving principles, which it's uh, ordering itself to. Why do we feel like uh, kind of the actions of people are random or that they're free? And this is a, this is a big theme for uh, people you know, of, of Kant's persuasion because they deeply want to, you know, they, they have to contend with the notion that, uh, you know, it's like the famous thing, like I'm holding this pen, right? Or like, you know, I, I just put this book down right? That was me. That wasn't the laws of nature. And, you know, because really this in some way, uh, it, to have a system of nature recalls an argument from Leibniz about the teleological argument for God, right? If there's a harmony to the nature's fundamental substances, the monads or Leibniz, uh, then this harmony admits of some kind of guiding principle to, to set them in motion. So that he has an analogy of a of like a clock, God is like the clockmaker, right? He has to he has to kind of tune the clock, and and then it and then it runs according to its uh, systems. But if that's the case, then we seem to be missing out. And Kant gives an example here in this first paragraph, uh, talking about statistical examples of like birth, death, and marriage rates. And he notices how these rates are affected by things like the weather. <laughs> you know, it's kind of very small things. And weather patterns are famously unreliable. Yet, nevertheless, uh, the weather still is able to sustain the, the ecological processes of the earth, right? Even though it's like, well, we can't predict what's going to, if it's going to rain tomorrow, if it's not going to rain tomorrow, right? You know, if you look at the Weather Channel app, it's a mixed bag. But yet, the weather still fulfills its end of kind of maintaining these things. And I think what Kant is really saying here is like, Look, you you observe a kind of stochastic character, a chaotic character to these things, and you might assume that it's all random or all free. But when you kind of zoom out um, and you start considering things more broadly, you're you're going to see that really these things do seem to conform to to principles. And one argument that are uh, that I thought was an interesting parallel here was that the uh, the Jewish philosopher Moses Maimonides. He once gave an argument uh, similar to this, which I think is instructive regarding the doctrine, the Christian doctrine of creation ex nihilo. He says at first, right, it seems impossible that creation could come out of nothing. But the seeming impossibility of this isn't a very good measure for kind of discounting something. He says, if you were told of the details of human pregnancy, which is, you know, how could a, how could a small human survive in an enclosed bag of liquid fed through a small tube in a very fragile environment dependent on all kinds of chemical processes. If you were to just describe this to, to a person who had no knowledge of pregnancy, it would seem that it would be impossible for a child to survive. They were, you know, there's so much that could go wrong. And yet people are born, right? And yet pregnancy still happens and people are, lots of people are born, right? So we can look at something and even if we look at its kind of minutia, we don't get an appreciation of it. And so there's a kind of unconscious element to we seem everything seems very free and loosey goosey, but in reality, we observe lots of patterns to the ordering of things. And we can conceive that, yeah, things might might go according to laws. 
So I think that was uh, another kind of element to, to contend with here. But what are your thoughts on that? No. Uh, yeah, I think it's an excellent example. I say we move on to the next okay. couple of propositions. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, regarding the second thesis, I think this is an important one. So I'll just read it out. Um, the second proposition, quote, in man, as the only rational creature on earth, those natural capacities which are directed to the use of his reason are to be fully developed only in the race, species, and not in the individual. And in his justification argument for this, he says that a single man, quote, a single man would have to live an excessively long period of time in order to learn to make full use of his natural capacities, unquote. So however, however far we might attain in our own lives, um, the full breadth of human knowledge can only but unfold over the course of many generations in the species. And, but that's not to say that individuals don't play a role. Right. Um, individuals are not, he says, he talks about the individual much more later on as well. But yeah. um, of course for Hegel, individuals are also very important in history. Um, and so to, to make a point here, uh, for Kant, people like Kepler and Newton play perhaps a very similar role as people like Napoleon do for Hegel. And so again, uh, if you'll allow it, I'll just quote Hegel here from philosophy of history. You can't see it. Philo his lectures on the philosophy of history, quote, such individuals, these like great men, had no consciousness of the general idea they were unfolding while prosecuting those aims of theirs. On the contrary, they were practical political men. But at the same time, they were thinking men who had an insight into the requirements of the time, what was ripe for development. This was the very truth of their age, for their world, the species next in order, so to speak, and which was already formed in the womb of time. Unquote. And so the point is, you know, I think especially what happens today is that people discount a great man theory of history, um, suggesting instead that it is only the social mass which drives historical processes. Um, for many different reasons, people simply say, well, great men um, don't exist or it's a fabrication of the elite, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that is a bourgeois impulse, right? That it's in fact laboring society which constitutes our existence and society and so forth um what happens in this time period in which Kant is writing is that those people the laboring masses come onto the stage previously there were only extras in the background but now they come to play a leading role in society and in the constitution of the political order um but that is not to say that great men don't exist that there aren't individuals who as hegel says um, identify what is ripe for development and develop it. Um, and so a king, a king might still make history with his decisions, with his edicts. Um, so too, uh, the society make history through its activity, but it's not so much the case that one is a fiction and the other isn't or whatever. Um, and so, yes, the great story of man is the story of the species but a part of that are these these individual stories right individuals who drive the process of enlightenment mm. that is that is what that are some thoughts i had on the second preposition yeah i you know i'd actually like to respond to that a, a minute but regarding the hegel you know i think you, you bring up a good point in in also in the history of philosophy hegel talks about Kind of the reason why great men drive history and it's because he thinks there's a kind of uh, quality to great men uh, by which they are uh, uniquely able to perceive kind of the world spirit that nobody else is right that everyone and i i think of this in terms of you can think of it as in paradigms right people within a paradigm can't see they, they're they're incapable of of viewing things outside of the paradigm but the world historical person uh, is from without, right? And and so in that case, he's uniquely able to. But uh, 
I think there admits some division with Hegel on, um, you know, the kind of way in which politics works and then the way in which, you know, we observe history because, you know, in, in the phenomenology, the, the, the end section, the last section of the preface of the phenomenology is going to ask the question, what is the role of the individual in recounting the, the kind of march of Geist, right? That's what, that's what he's going to call it. And he says, in some sense, the individual in recounting this process needs to fade away, needs to dissolve. And it's sort of, uh, you think about it like when you're, if you're stargazing, right? Or, if you're, or even if you're looking at a, just a kind of vast expanse, right? You can't just, uh, you know, you, you can't just pick out a star, right? And say like, oh, whoa, there's there's the Big Dipper, right? When you're, I mean, it's like, you must kind of forget the individual in order to consider the totality of it all, right? When you're looking at a picture of the cosmos or you're looking at the stars somewhere, you, you, you're not sitting there and finger pointing. You may, you mean you might, but, you know, that's, you know, stargazing really is contemplating the whole. And in, when we're when we're going through spirit, I think Hegel is definitely going to have the idea of uh, history in his time or philosophy in his time has moved beyond the need for geniuses. Hegel actually makes several critiques of the idea of genius uh, in his, whereas in in Schelling, uh, Schelling will talk about the necessity of genius in art, where someone you know genius is required for people to have actually uh, you know. That means you're in tune with the world soul to be a genius. But Hegel is going to critique this notion and say, uh, no, it, you know, genius might work in, in other things and it might work in politics, but in philosophy, it's not going to work uh, because really the genius, uh, you know, to, to do the work of philosophy is to do the labor, is to be able to explain what you're doing. Whereas if we think of a kind of genius or a great person, the mark of the genius we would think is someone who they just do. Right, you know, they they they're they're a virtuoso at something, and they they really can't explain, right? And I think Hegel is deeply, uh, deeply opposed to that idea when he when he confronts its role in philosophy. But yeah, I, I think in some sense, still there's going to be a heavy emphasis on the individual. I think uh, propositions two through four are really going to be centered around um, kind of the role of the individual and and how the individual is going to make use of his rational capabilities in, in society. All right, so, you know, we, we've talked about a little bit of the, the role that individuals play in, in recounting history and in making history. And a defining feature of, of this for Kant is gonna be, well, why, how are we able to do this through our rational, through our rational powers, right? Which is what you, which is the first thing that you brought up on the uh, on proposition two. And I think just to set this up, kind of two through four are gonna deal with this theme of the 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 reason, the reasoning powers of the individual, how they're exercised in society, what's the what's the purpose of this for society? Why did nature give us give us reason? And here is where we're gonna finally get into a, a distinctively liberal theory of the individual and of society, and as we go on in further propositions, ultimately of the state, I think you could could really cite this as a as a profound example of of kind of uh, the progression of you get a liberal theory of the individual, a liberal theory of society, or, or like social mechanisms, what they're supposed to do, and then finally a liberal theory of state and even um, kind of supranational state structures. So. Uh, we can get into that, but I I want to get um, you know what do you make of the kind of reason here? You know he says that um, you know, reason is the faculty which enables that creature to extend far beyond the limits of natural instinct and the rules and intentions it follows in using its various powers and the range of its projects is unbounded. So what's what do you make of that? Um, I think, again, it, it gets at what was mentioned much earlier during the introduction, which is human perfectibility, um, that we can come to to reflect on our own lives, um, on our activity, and structure it differently. 
And this is rel very relevant to what he'll say later about, again, the just constitution of society, that it's, um, it's almost perhaps an experiment. It's something that can is calibrated and recalibrated and that we, uh, we reflect on and change accordingly. Um, I don't know. I mean, are you asking, what, what are you asking about reason beyond that? Um, yeah, I, I guess. So, you know, he, he's gonna, he's gonna talk about reason being a, a germ, right? Which, uh, recalls to mind the idea of a development of it. It's the germ of humanity in the sense that nature has implanted reason within people and it's going to develop. But like, so what, what do you make of the idea when he says, um, you know, it's, it, well, what's the interplay here between every person is born with reason, right? But then he says, well, we have to get in society or the reason to actually take take root of that. What what do you make of that? Okay. Yeah. Um the the society society is so again, I'll go rewind a little bit back to the thesis, the proposition where he says that um we only fully develop in the species as opposed to in the individual. Um society is where the species is most imminent in the here and now. It's the closest approximation we have to a kind of species life. And I know that that term has uh, different connotations, but it's just to say that, you know, when we enter into association with fellow men, we live a very different kind of life, a life that, um, well, that, 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 puts us into contact with, with others. It allows us to, I mean, on a very practical level to exchange ideas. Um, right. Another way I've heard it put is that imagine Robinson Crusoe's Island where Crusoe, you know, you are, uh, your own poet, your own historian, your own critic and so on and so forth. I mean, we can imagine the kind of poetry and history and, criticisms that will emerge from from this kind of life it's not going to be very interesting it's not going to reach very far very different thing happens in society um society is also what occasions the division of labor which is to say that we can um focus our reason we can subsist off of the surplus produced by others right and commit ourselves to um, a particular area on our own in a hypothetical state of nature where we are left to our own devices, right? We'll probably spend far more time um, gathering our subsistence. And so there's just less, much less room for development. So it's about the kind of possibilities that society opens up. Yeah. And the belief, I think, during this time is that these possibilities are, in fact, infinite. Yeah, for sure. I, I think I want to call attention to to one thing here, uh, where he says that reason allows the creature to extend far beyond the limits of natural instinct. And I think this is very important for us to, especially within Kant's thought himself. Um, so reason allows the creature to extend beyond its its instincts. And this is going to recall something that Aristotle brings up in this is book three chapters around chapters four and five of the nicomachean epics where he is going to talk about okay what you know there are a couple there are a few types of action voluntary and involuntary action well what makes an action voluntary what what makes you choose it because voluntary action is moral action it's action you can be held responsible for and that's true with kant as well so Voluntary action, Aristotle is going to say, is going to require some faculty of deliberation that animals lacked. And, and animals act on impulse or, you know, emotively. And because of this, they're in a way, uh, you know, it's kind of compulsive for them, right? If you cannot react but one way to a set of stimuli, you're not very free. 
And so he's going to talk about, you know, deliberation as being a kind of mediation between your desire and then also your, uh, like the means of, by, by which you act, right? So your desire, you have a desire to do something, but then your deliberation allows you to assess the various means of something. And it's precisely because of this assessment that we might say it's free, right? Yes, the desire is external to you, right? But at the same time, you're acting deliberatively in the sense that you're kind of weighing ends. It's the mediation between desire and then uh, the ends to, you know, the, the means of attaining this end. And so uh, when we take things under deliberation, our actions have that kind of individual character to them. And this is going to be instrumental to Kant's own theory of freedom, which is namely just kind of the idea that your rational faculties allow you to escape the sort of prison that desire and instinct have, you know, encaged you in and allow you to act according to the moral law. And if you want to get a a good think on this. Charles Taylor has a very good essay called um, Kant's Theory of Freedom, where he kind of expounds this, I think, in a very accessible way. And so they're unbounded in the sense that uh, they allow us to be free. They allow us to self-determine. Um, so I think that's a very uh, important thing to consider when we talk about um, the use of of reason as uh, as being able, as being self-determining or free. Um but you bring up now to segue to the second issue, you bring up the good issue of, of perfectibility. And so um, I think Kant is going to, when, when he says that, you know, we have to enter, we have to enter society in order to kind of reach the full extent of, of our reason. And this is going to be uh, akin to what Aristotle says in book one of the politics, where people need the state because the state is where you reason about things. You know, it's where you reason about justice and, uh, you know, kind of the moral virtues, which is ultimately what you're supposed to be doing, right? And Kant is going to say a similar thing, but he's eventually going to really kind of dramatically break with, you could think about Aristotle or even later Hegel is going to, you know, kind of break from Kant here. So I, I want to get out of, uh, you know, going into, all right, so we have the reasoning individual, right? We have a reasoning individual. He's going to enter in a society where he can use the full, uh, lengths of his reason. But then we're going to talk about antagonisms, which he's going to get into in the third and fourth proposition. So what do you make of, Kant's going to say that antagonism is just endemic. In fact, it's good. And it's like, that's what reason is supposed to develop. So what, what do you make of, of this kind of line? Yeah, this is, this is uh, probably the meat of most of this essay. Yeah. It begins in the fourth proposition, talks about uh, man's unsocial sociability. Um, <laughs> what sounds, a nice turn of phrase, right? Yeah, it, it's uh, it's paradoxical, but let's let's try to unpack it a little bit. Um, so one way that this might get taken up is that, you know, man, man is driven towards associating with others, but he's just helplessly greedy. He's just greedy. I think that's probably how many people read this. Um, quote: Man has an inclination to associate with others. Because in society, he feels himself to be more than man, i.e. as more than the developed form of his natural capacities, unquote. So I think at one point he talks about vain glory and the kinds of things that men men can achieve in society yeah. that can only be attained in society. Just that might, yeah. Para, you know, just plagiarize from Leviathan, right? <laughs> it's just... People seek, uh, you know, status and glory and honor, and so they're going to try to dominate people, and they have to do that in a social context. Um, yes, exactly. But I also suspect that maybe there's a, a, another reading here. Um, it raises the issue of quantitative and qualitative change, right? So perhaps vainglory would be a what we might call a quantitative change. Um, but it is. Let, let, let's structure this a little bit. So man is helplessly individualistic. He is helplessly unsociable, but he's compelled to associate with others for practical reasons. We've mentioned the division of labor, right? 
living off of the work of others and helping others live off of the work, um, dividing tasks between people. So there are practical reasons for us to associate. And perhaps we also seek um, to compete with others. Of course, this, this whole schema gets received in our own time as the antagonism between individualism and collectivism, right? This is, uh, this is very much inherited from this time period. For Kant, the space that opens up between man's unsociability and his sociability is society, culture, the state. These very much mediate between these two, right? Um, man enters into society. The result are these institutions of mediation. The qualitative change that takes place is that is the just constitution, right? The just constitution of this society, of these institutions of mediation, is not just um, an increase of institutions. It's not just a quantitative augmentation of them. It is a fundamental qualitative change of what these institutions do, what they appear as, right? The qualitative change is affected in society. Does that mean that individuals do not themselves go through qualitative changes? I'm not so sure. It could be the case. But to now further maybe unpack a little bit competition and the unsociability here, he makes, I think, a fairly standard argument, which is, again, very much received in contemporary wisdom, um, which is adversity breeds ingenuity. He gives the example of the forest, right? A tree that is on its own, maybe on a pasture, does not have to um, compete for sunlight. So it can grow crooked and deformed and just... Whichever way it wants, right? Whichever way it wants. Yeah. However, in a densely, in a dense forest, there are trees competing for sunlight. And so they rise up higher and higher. They have a, a straight stature and they reach as high as they can, right? And so the, the point being made here is that human beings compete inside society. And this competition, whatever um, its, uh, its motivation might be, vain glory or a better life or what have you, happiness. He talks a lot about happiness as one thing, which is kind of what nature dangles in front of us. Um, but these things breed ingenuity. We do not innovate from a state of contentment. We innovate from a desire to perhaps be better than others, right? Or just to be better ourselves. But we certainly don't really do it on our own. We do it in the company of others. So I know that's a lot there. Um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I have so I had some thoughts on this as well, especially on the subject of qualitative change and quantitative change. And I think I'd like to do this by... Uh, by comparing uh, Kant saying and, and Aristotle. So I, I think we, we might be able to say that this uh, kind of the theory of the individual that is given here, and, and Kant is gonna say that, uh, here, here's the idea, right? He goes, um, you know, without these asocial qualities, which cause the resistance encountered by each individual as he furthers his self-seeking pretensions, man would live in an Arcadian pastoral existence of perfect concord, self-sufficiency, and mutual love, right? But then he says, but all human talents would remain hidden forever in a dormant state. I think we are able to say that this is a decisively liberal and individualist theory of the individual. And this goes back to um, Hobbes in Leviathan in, in part one, where he talks about how in the state of nature, life is poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That's a very famous quote, you know, if you're in your undergrad political theory seminar. And the thing is, this is a complete reversal of kind of political wisdom until now, which makes it very revolutionary. It's uh, it's if Kant was a Copernican turn 
in kind of philosophy or in critique of perception, Hobbes had a Copernican turn in political philosophy and in theories of the individual. So in, in book one of the politics, you're going to see that Aristotle is going to say, he says, further, the state is by nature clearly prior to the family and to the individual, since the whole is of necessity prior to the part. For example, if the whole body be destroyed, there will be no foot or hand, except in an equivocal sense, as we might speak of a stone hand, for when the destroyed hand will be no better than that. But things are defined by their working and power, and we ought not to say that they are the same when they no longer have their proper quality, but only when they have the same name. The proof that the state is a creation of nature and prior to the individual is that the individual, when isolated, is not self-sufficing, and therefore he is like a part in relation to the whole. So, you know, th this... In, in a real sense for Aristotle, you do not properly become a human unless you are a member of a state, right? You are, uh, you're an animal if you're um, exiled from the state, right? And to be exiled from the state, to be exiled from the community was to be treated like a kind of animal. And you see this in a lot of literature. You can see this uh, in the Bible as well. I think there's a, there's a Persian king in the Bible that's talked about um, perhaps this is when I think it's in the time it's in the book of Daniel, where Daniel is asked to interpret the dreams of this king, and he interprets what the king is having a dream where he will go insane. And it says the king, uh, for a period of seven years, is exiled from his kingdom, and he lives as if he were an animal, right? He 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 behaves as an animal. So there's a real sense that that kind of uh, that kind of political wisdom that's very deeply rooted where the state is not just simply an area where uh, that it's good for you, but it's what makes you a human being altogether. And I think there is a distinctive turn when we get to Hobbes and Kant, where it's, well, the individual is prior to the state. And what is the state? But what Kant says, the social union of individuals. I think it's a very key phrase, right? in the idea that the individual is in somewhat sufficient outside of outside the confines of society in a, in some bare way and he enters society because it would benefit him well because in some sense Kant will say it, it allows you to be moral um which there is that's why there's a compulsion to enter uh, but you can still morally act kind of by yourself um, in the strict sense but nevertheless you're still fully rational Right? You're still endowed with the germ of reason outside of the state. And so when we talk about qualitative and quantitative uh, differences, when we talk about the theory of the individual, for Aristotle, it is a matter of quality. Going from the state of nature to the state, right? you, be, you actually become a, a person, uh, just you become a rational animal in the state, versus Kant, where... You know, he talks about the Arcadian existence where it's, ah, you know, you, you would be self-sufficient, but your talents would be unrealized, right? I think there is a real idea that it's it's just kind of quantitative, right? You know, the state really allows you to maximize. And then, you know, later in the just constitution, I think you are correct in pointing out a qualitative difference between the just constitution and other states. Whereas that's what he that's what he'll talk about, you know, in his society. All that's missing is the moral dimension of uh, of moral maturity, but really, we I think we 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 see this uh, you know kind of in in the liberal theory where it's well we are we are individuals regardless, and in that sense they there's a kind of radical freedom to this where the state doesn't define you anymore properly, right? Yes, you know it still makes your life. Uh, you know, much richer than it ordinarily would be. And yeah, you know, for Kant, you're, you're going to have a moral duty to be a part of the state and to engage in civic life. But nevertheless, there is that kernel in there of, well, even then you're still an individual. And he talks about, you know, where Hobbes, the state of nature is, you know, or the state is clearly preferable to the state of nature. Rousseau is going to deny this. Rousseau is going to say the state of nature is clearly more desirable than the state. Right. And Kant's even, I think Kant's even going to talk about this in, uh, in, I think, in one of the later propositions. But I want to talk, you know, maybe engage in a bit of a, in a bit of a critical element that um, people like Hegel are, are going to notice, which is, well, in this sense, 
um, the state for the liberal for Kant is a kind of social framework which is going to maximize human freedom. He's going to say this later. However, liberal society accomplishes this in a very unheroic way. Uh, namely, to live in the liberal state is to live in a state where you enjoy freedom over your reason, but your freedom is uh, only in so far as it doesn't conflict with the freedom of others. And so in some sense, it's uh, it's less meaningful or, or it's more meaningless. And the uh, I think there are a couple of good treatments of this. Um, the philosopher Ed Halper has a good paper called Aristotle and the Liberal State, where he addresses the kind of meaninglessness of liberal life. But more famously, Charles Taylor is going to confront this in a series of lectures in the 90s uh, called The Malay of Modernity, where he talks about individualism has wrought a kind of meaninglessness in our in our lives where, you know, we we um we live in the we live in the individualist state, but we are because of the in, in the state as being simply an instrument of the individual. People are kind of confronted with the idea that what they do um, within society is simply just that which doesn't offend others in a in a rudimentary way. And if it's you know, it's really just freedom to do um, you know to this kind of action. Well. In what sense do we start to lose the sort of moral horizons which make life in the state richer? Whereas, you know, for someone like Aristotle, well, it's like, no, the, in, these institutions like the state are just fundamental to your your species being, right? They're not just simply, it's not simply a matter of quantity. But yeah, I, I know that's very long, but um, no, no, no. That... I, think, I think there's an element there. I would like to sort of, I would like to interact because, you know, I think there is. Charles Taylor, right, uh, really does grasp onto a correct idea. I think in society that people feel a, a dramatic sense that, well, our choices don't really matter. Even though we live in the, the best of all possible worlds, the freest society, it's like, well, uh, you know, it's just the state is just an instrument for you. It doesn't do anything for you uh, in a qualitative sense. But what's your, what's your reaction here? Uh, a lot of good stuff. And yeah, I agree. Let's try to interact with it a little bit. Um, going back to what you said earlier, different ways of viewing life um, in these philosophies. The Greeks admit of a distinction between Zoe and Bios. Bios being the form political life in the polis and Zoe being bare, naked animal life. And that there's a very, very significant difference between the two. A human who is mere Zoe is an animal. Um, and uh, this was this was very important. This was a very important distinction. Whereas for Khan, for us, you know, all men are created equal, right? This is our our basic uh, ethos there. Um, so there's a very significant change that happens there. Yeah, it is a break for sure. Now I do want to go into Rousseau here a little bit because I think what Rousseau was perhaps warning us. Of course, Kant is not directly quoting Rousseau, but he's um, he is quoting Rousseau in a certain sense. Rousseau warned us of precisely what is happening now, because Kant says that, quote, Rousseau was not far wrong in preferring the state of savages, so long that is, as the, as the last stage to which the human race must climb is not attained, unquote. So this last stage is the just constitution. So what Kant is a the idea that Kant is attributing to Rousseau is that we would be better off in really the hypothetical state of nature yeah. than this, right? Until we've, of course, Rousseau is not um, giving up on the attainment of a just constitution. It's just that until we get there, right, we would probably feel like we prefer some earlier state, right? And so maybe one way in which that uh, manifests is kind of this feeling of deprivation or certainly maybe a, an amoral existence that is just intolerable, right? It is, it is driving us uh, back, into this, back into nature, right? As opposed to, of course, Kant's argument is that this is the kind of adversity which will be overcome in the pursuit of the just constitution, right? So that which is constantly um, threatening to undo society, that which 
compels us to abandon society is in fact what has to be overcome to more fully realize society itself, the just constitution of society. Um, that is what's going on here. That is the task that Khan yeah. is picking up on, that Rousseau picked up on, and that we very much still live with. Yeah, I think um, that, that, and that's something that's going to be picked up, you know, by people after Khan. But I think you know, we just today we can ask um, when we're when we're these antagonisms. Khan seems to imply that well, the existence of the antagonisms begets the possibility of their solution, and why. This is something that this is jumping way ahead, but I think it's appropriate. He's going to say, "Well, we noticed in the past that these um, things that felt like they were obstacles to our development, namely the state of barbarism or you know primitive uh, life, it seems like a, a an obstacle for us. But in reality, it's what invited um, our development." And Kant says, "Well, looking at the past." You know, we 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 see that we have overcome these things, and if we have the principles in mind, we can be relatively sure that the antagonisms um, are going to beget a solution to them. And the solution, of course, as we said, you know, kind of the next topic where I guess we're going to get into the you know the just constitution. The solution is the just constitution, and for Kant, this is kind of the state of of maximal you know, of, of maximal freedom, right? Which is you know we're, we're going to have um we're we're going to be able to exercise our freedom subject to the to the freedom of others and he identifies um kind of he identifies three things that will determine the just constitution which uh, are going to be picked up which is the correct idea of the nature of the constitution what it should do experience of the world to test these things you know it's justification and then the goodwill which is prepared to accept the outcomes of the experience which is you know kind of we must respond to the right reason and we notice that uh if we're going back and we're still struggling with this one proof of this is that this is those three criteria are almost exactly the project of the American political philosopher John Rawls in his book A Theory of Justice, which hopefully we're going to get to kind of review on on this channel, um, is going to pick up precisely with these three criteria, which is how do we rationally construct a just state? Right, the theory of justice is, uh, you know, Rawls of course is an admitted Kantian. Uh, a scholar of Kant, but the theory of justice is going to be what is the just constitution? He's going to be picking up the same problem and he's going to notice a lot of the same antagonisms. And so we see we're still struggling with that, with that today. And of course, Kant is going to say, as Rawls is going to say, what is required, you know, the goodwill, he's going to say, in his society presently. Humans have cultured, they've cultivated themselves through art, they've cultured themselves, they've civilized themselves via cultural norms. One thing they haven't done is reached moral maturity. And this stage of moral maturity, Kant thinks, is going to be kind of the last, you know, that's the last piece to fall into place. And moral maturity, of course, for Kant is going to be submission to uh, the universal moral law. Which again, hope you know, we don't have to go into that here. Again, I, I think I referenced the Charles Taylor essay. He goes into that very nicely. But in some sense, you must obliterate, right, that kind of instinctual desire in yourself to be to be free. And what people like Hegel are going to take up with, take issue with, and a lot of modern day Aristotelians are going to take issue with this. You can look at people like uh, G. E. M. Anscombe, right, or even Alistair McIntyre these kind of modern Aristotelians who are going to look at this and say, well, if our submission to the moral law, you know, this absolute submission, if it is going to annihilate our previous ways of life, our substantial life, our culture, and alienate us from those things, then there's going to be, there might be a problem, right? If the just society requires that we completely submit to the triumph of reason, right? Then when we do so, you know, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to give up a lot of you know defining features of our society. Charles Taylor has a great analogy for this when he says, "Well, when we think about uh, kind of fighting over in you know in in Homer's Iliad, when they're fighting over 
uh, who to award. I think there's, I, I don't think it's Helena. It's a different lady in the story. I can't recall exactly who, but there's a fight between a Agamemnon and like Menelaus of you know, who gets the girl. Right. And we might say that according to ancient Greek society, one of them is probably right, right, in courts of honor. But Charles Saylor points out, well, we look back on that now and we say women aren't objects to be, you know, treated as spoils of war. This is unjust. This is absolutely unjust. However, to rectify the injustice would require annihilating ancient Greek society. And this is something Hegel's going to pick up brilliantly in the unhappy consciousness, right? The development of the, the person who sees that the moral law is good and just. And he says, yeah, Kant is right. You know, uh, acting according to reason is a good thing. But a person who sees the, the superiority of the universal uh, is also going to pick up on the fact that it's impossible in some way or it's alienating in some way. And there's a trap to fall into a kind of nihilism that's, that emerges from a, a point of indifference between the universal and the subjective right so if these two aren't properly reconciled it's you know people are going to choose the indifference point which is to not care right which is to abandon all meaning and i think this is something that we really have to contend with when we look at things kant says here which is all right now looking at our society how many people are at a state of indifference to to things right how many people have reached you know, just the point where we don't care about the just constitution anymore. We don't care about the moral law, right? It's just, it seems like it's alienating us from it, uh, despite our attempts at social engineering or whatnot. But I know that was very long. Um, I, I just, do you have any thoughts on that? No, right on the money, despite attempts at social engineering, right? Um, this this notion that we could perhaps experiment with the social constitution until we attain towards a a more perfect, more perfect, right? Um, not necessarily finally perfect, but more perfect and just constitution. This notion um, suggests technocracy, right? Um, and that can be a very off-putting idea, but something very different is happening in the Enlightenment period, right? They're not indifferent technocrats. Right. Um, there is kind of there there's I don't know if we could call it a moral dimension. Um probably uh expand on that a little bit more. But but yeah. All right. So now that we kind of talk about uh, the function of the just constitution, Kant is gonna want to bring up uh and remember we gotta keep the frame of principles of universal history. So I think we could track just to recount just briefly here, right? The reason why the state is developing is because of the antagonisms that are kind of inherent to human nature, right? So at first we have the individual, right? The individual in his reason, his reason is going to uh, compel great advancements where he's going to be able to kind of ascertain the world in a much different way than animals. And also endemic to man is a, you know, he wants to be a part of a society, but he's also greedy and, or, you know, there's also conflicts that emerge in society, right? Yeah, I guess that's just a nature, you might say, nothing too controversial. Eventually, then the state emerges to resolve these conflicts, to mediate these conflicts. And then a just state emerges where people have, the just constitution emerges out of a kind of rational process where we, you know, we subject our, 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 our norms to right reason. And after a kind of testing process, a kind of formulation, we end up at the just constitution, the equilibrium. And now Kant is going to talk about, all right, well, if these principles motivate individuals and states, they're going to motivate the relations between other states. So this is a really very kind of basic genetic argument. If what's true for the part must be true for the whole, right? Um, so yeah, without getting too much into it, um, you know, I I want to you know first talk about you know he he says okay, just as there are conflicts between individuals, there are conflicts between nations, and there are wars. And he has a very interesting quote where he says, "quote All wars are accordingly so many attempts, not indeed by the intention of men, but by the intention of nature, to bring about." new relations between states and the destruction or at least the dismemberment of old entities to create new ones. 
So again, you have a process by which uh, almost very grim, it sounds like humanity, there's struggle, there's war, but the war ends up in an equilibrium. And, uh, you know, this, this equilibrium is going to be reached and he says it will be automatically maintained. It will, it will just kind of end. Oh boy, right? Uh, very much recalling the, the meme you get of Francis Fukuyama, End of History and the Last Man, where there is a final equilibrium. And um, many people, I think, falsely attribute an end of history uh, in the liberal sense to Hegel. And certainly Fukuyama cites Hegel, but here it's incredibly explicit, right? Kant not only has an end to history uh, in terms of the relations of states, but it's a specific end. He knows what it looks like. It's going to look like uh, a just constitution in a federation of states, of just states. And there's a different essay where he kind of explicates this in um, Perpetual Peace. I think it's called Perpetual Peace, a Philosophical Sketch, where he's going to talk about what is international law going to do in this equilibrium, et cetera, et cetera. But he's going to talk about that there. But I'd like to kind of engage this and say, all right, well, he says there's an inevitable outcome of the distress which men involve in one another is a world federation. And uh, we might see that, uh, is this is this true? Kant seems to imply that there's an inherently stable form of government um, or form of uh, governing relations between states. And certainly, to bring this now, after the fall of the Soviet Union, many people thought this too, right? Um, we don't want to get too much into current events, but we might think whether current events have uh, have undermined this notion, whether there has been a return of history, or just whether we have reached an equilibrium, or there is even an equilibrium kind of possible. So, what's what do you make of that? Okay, yeah, I'll I'll take it from the beginning again. Um, go into what you said, the genetic argument. Um, just to explain what I held the genetic argument to be here, which is that, again, we think about the tree analogy of individuals in society, competition drives uh, ingenuity, the trees in a in densely packed forest rise up to the top. Similarly, states driven to compete with each other seek to promote cultural, scientific, right, human advancement within their borders, right? And this occurs, presumably, perhaps, um, in the states that are competing with each other. So there is a kind of, maybe not a simultaneous, but a gradual attainment towards the just constitution in many different states by virtue of the competition that exists between them. So we see these states rising up, right? Um, in a sense, also uh, creating by themselves, the conditions for their own modification, for their own transformation into a just constitution, right? The king might not very well be aware of this. The king might think he's only advancing the culture because, well, yeah. you know, the German king wants to be more culturally advanced than the French and so on. But the result is that the populations of both countries become enlightened and maybe reflect on the whole system of monarchy. Um, but um, so that is the the genetic argument. Then. The federation of states, yeah, I, I think one would be mistaken to read this as a political program. Um, perhaps that's what Francis Fukuyama did, right? We get, at one point, Kant even uses the terminology League of Nations. Of course, the actual League of Nations was named after what Kant is talking about here. Um, today, we have the United Nations. Um, so is this what Kant was talking about? Um, is this the, the Federation of Commonwealths? Is this this kind of stable order? Well, there I don't really know, but there are two ways I think some people might like to think about this. One, if, if they accept what Khan is talking about here, of course. One is that, yes, we have in fact attained to this, this existence, right? Of course, you know, we're very good at finding reasons to maybe uh, excuse the, the lack of peace, right? The lack of a perpetual peace, um, whether we're concerned with China or Russia or Iran or what have you. And even when we're not concerned with any of those countries, you know, terrorism, 
we're we're concerned with terrorism and terrorism is a reason to maybe um hold off on peace and it's the reason why we're not living in the the liberal global utopia um we're very good at finding reasons for saying that that's that is not the case um another way of thinking about it might be that well we'll just stretch out the timeline I think a lot of Marxists do this in the sense that what seemed possible in 1848 and then in 1917, that is to say socialism, really is not possible until some indefinite point in the future. That Marx was still correct in his diagnosis and prognosis of capitalism, just he maybe got the dates wrong a little bit. What he thought was going to happen in his own lifetime might happen in ours. Um Capitalism has the markets haven't spread far enough. They haven't taken up all the space that they can. And so Marx still stands to be proven correct. I think that's a way of one could read Kant that we have not yet attained to the just constitution. And so, you know, we, we might try to delude ourselves by setting up these organizations like the United Nations, but we have not yet attained to this federation of commonwealths. Those are just the two ways that immediately sprung out to me, ways in which we could think about this. What do you think? Yeah. And that I, is a question to you directly and perhaps <laughs> also to others. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, on on one hand, right, I think, you know, we definitely, there's a very traceable line. I think I say this a lot about Kant. And we might say very uniquely Kant is certainly a philosopher of the current order. And it's true. Um, but on the other hand, right, when we think about, all right, when Kant says in his own society that, well, we're civilized, we're cultured, but we're not morally mature, right? we might, you know, might think, well, we're not morally mature either. And, you know, today's moral maturity, obviously, it looks much different from that of Kant. But I think there could be a, a similar kind of argument made by uh, people who are sympathetic to this point of view, namely that we haven't advanced the now instead of where where Kant it was kind of submission to the to the moral absolute moral law. Uh, we might say that the dialogue around human rights has replaced this, which is we have not succeeded in kind of exporting human rights or expanding human rights to people far enough to where we get um, you know an equilibrium of states. Right? It's you know very tempting to look at the third world and say. Well, if we look at the third world, right, it's just, oh, of course, you know, you know, yeah, we, yes, we haven't achieved the equilibrium because we haven't, you know, there are people are dying in the third world or there's a lot of problems that we can note. And these are probably real problems, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, it does seem, uh, well, what is it, what is, what is it going to take, right? There mm -hmm. seems some, something, you know, the language of Kant is, uh, you know, or the or the specific thing Kant was talking about, his submission to the moral law, is gone. But something has replaced it, right? Something has immediately taken hold of it, and that's where we get to you know to use Marx again in the 18th Brumaire. He talks about resurrecting the ghosts of the, of past revolutions, right? Dressing ourselves up. So just as uh, Kant was saying, like, oh, for shame, the the promiscuity of of Ma of the 18th century, it just prevents us from becoming enlightened because. You know, ostensibly that's what he's talking about. Whereas now it's, oh, shame, right? The 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 oppression of the 21st century is what prevents us from reaching enlightenment. So again, this is caricaturing, you know, these kinds of things, but I think they in a very real sense allow us to think about the ways which we kind of continually uh, re resurrect this dialogue and then try to say oh, there's always one more thing that's preventing us from reaching the just constitution maybe right maybe <laughs> but um again i'm reminded of the kind of line of uh people like charles taylor or michael sandel even hegel which is we want to pump the brakes on this right which is if we have an absolute vision of society, of the utopia, right, and we're trying to drag humanity along with it, what is the cost along the way, right? What are we? And so I, I don't want to make any, I don't really want to come down to any firm conclusions, but just something I think is really worth considering just to kind of 
in some way look about uh and you know, we all have a sense that something's wrong today and when we read Kant critically engaging with a text like this uh not just attempting to understand but also looking at okay you know Kant what are the effects of this I think it really does help us understand better a feeling of alienation that we see today but I think know, yeah yeah putting the brakes on it is an interesting way of saying it um yeah. I think it's a conservative impulse that could be very productive, right? Certainly, I think it would not be very helpful at this time to read, again, this in a very programmatic way, which is to say that that we in the United States or in Western Europe have attained to a just constitution, and what's precluding this existence of a peaceful federation of commonwealths is just that we haven't exported it enough, Yeah. right? We haven't exported uh, liberal democracy to Russia and to China and to God knows how many other places, right? Um, that is perhaps something that we would want to put the brakes on. And maybe if that's probably a very unsatisfying answer, but I think, I think that's the right impulse at the very least. Yeah. You know, and it's not even, um, we, we might think it's a conservative impulse, but maybe it's just uh, a kind of conceptual, right. Of, or, or, uh, we want to call into question the validity of such a theory that requires us to be so deeply alienated from kind of the structures which seem to inform us, namely local culture or other culture. If the just constitution requires that we annihilate these things as backward or as uh, obstacles to enlightenment, well, if we if we do that, what are what kind of people are we left with, right? It seems we are left with a society of very alienated people. And right now we live in a society of very alienated people. Again, something to think about. Uh, but yeah, so I think here we go um, in proposition, in the latter half of proposition seven, and then finally through nine, Kant's going to talk about um, how we can expect history to unfold. And he says, these possibilities boil down to the question whether it is rational to assume that the order of nature is purposive in its parts, but purposeless in its whole. So we get into this idea that Kant is going to say that historically, the idea of a, of a story is belongs to a novel, but can it belong to history? Is history a progression in some way? Kant's going to come down in the affirmative on this. And it's really... Perhaps um, not uh, not a beginning because we're we're going to see this in people like David Hume, who writes his five volume history of England, which is cited as a very prominent example of the phenomena of Whig history, namely liberal history, which is history as a development from uh, barbarity to civilization, or from not good conditions to better conditions, and. He's going to say that, uh, well, there are lots of stages of development that inhibit or uh, that inhibit our capacities. But he, he runs a modus tollens on this where he says, yes, we have been hindered by our development, but it's precisely the inhibition that proves that nature operates according to definitive purposes and that these purposes will be overcome. And therefore, what seems to be holding us back at one juncture is what is going to motivate us to go forward. And, you know, so what, what's going to make this a, a development possible? And, you know, it talks about moral maturity. Um, you know, civilization, I think, in some sense for Kant, is working on us as a, as a kind of object, right? Uh, working to civilize us, to develop us. That's what nature is, and that's why he's going to talk about kind of providential feature to it. And it won't be entirely intelligible to us, the how civilization is working on us as object, since we are stuck in the, the, the subject, right? We are observing what's happening in a kind of first person point of view. But uh, when we look back, when we try to incorporate a broad vision, we're gonna see the development that has been taking place and so he's going to conclude to kind of resolve the problem of 
that is that is set out uh, whether this is possible he's going to say yes right this is you know it is possible to have a universal history uh, for the cosmopolitan idea and i think throughout we we have addressed this enough throughout by just looking at kind of the arguments he gives but i wanted to end up um talking about the universal concept what all right what's the end of history it is the quote universal cosmopolitan existence right that is one of the things we're left with and we're left to wonder what is the universal cosmopolitan existence and how are we going there so i I kick that back to you, but like you said, I also kick that back to uh, people who might watch or who might read this text and think about it. What is it? What is the the cosmopolitan uh, existence? The cosmopolitan again, may, people might read one world government or something into this. Um, I think the cosmopolitan view is the view from is the view of species right again the universal history would have to be a history of man um it's it, it can't just be a history of one nation or one tribe or what have you um it's the history of the elaboration of man's talents and man's institutions of government and so a cosmopolitan existence would be perhaps a more natural existence. Now that's just another way of, of stating it, right? Yeah. Effectively more what I'm realized. saying is, yeah, well, what I'm, yeah, it might not be as clear because maybe it just sounds like what I'm saying is when he says cosmopolitan, he just means natural. He said, then what does natural mean? So what is the, the natural? I'm not sure. Um, well, I think it's precisely the idea of the germ of reason, right? There is a potency that is within human individuals, just as there is a potency within an acorn for an oak tree. There is a potency within human beings of reason. And the universal cosmopolitan existence, we might say, is the fully actualized uh expression development of this reasoned capability um that sounds nice however it's very abstract for, yeah. you know in the case of an acorn what is it it's an oak tree right <laughs> what is the universal you know but and when i say well it's the full expression of your rational capability great um so what is it you know i like i agree with you i i don't entirely know uh, it's not clear kant gives indicators Right? He gives things that he thinks are going to take place. And that's what the things like the Feder, you know, the Federation of Commonwealths is going to, is going to say. He actually makes a, a decent number of predictions here, um, namely that uh, wars are eventually going to end. <laughs> um, I, we, I think it's safe to say he's wrong about that one, um, at least from his time. Right? He talks about the idea of war being unprofitable, which, like it or not, it was clearly profitable. It, it clearly has been profitable for people since Kant. Um, but in view of that, what are we what are we even to make of a cosmopolitan existence? And I think just thinking about the question is actually uh, more useful than speculating it because its allure is precisely its abstraction. We are constantly presented, we might say, even today with a better world as possible. But this better world needs to remain abstract in order to have its allure, right? Because once we start to determine it, right, once we start to take it apart, we realize that it might not be the better world that we assumed it was, right? The more we start to inquire about this, the more we're going to realize uh, the difficulties of the business of utopia. And in keeping it abstract, in using a phrase like universal cosmopolitan existence, uh, you know, just to be just to play a critical part here, maybe that's precisely the idea. It is abstract, and it needs to be abstract because its abstraction is what gives it its power that we're moving toward it. Uh, because the more we understand it, maybe the more difficulties that arise. Right? Certainly, this is the case with expounding a theory of justice. Right? Uh, any theory of justice for a society, we have considerations. We have intuitions 
But when we start to try to build something from this, we realize it's much tougher than what we originally expected. Again, this is something Hegel very nicely points out, right? Um, but maybe there is a temptation now, even now, to continue to live in the abstraction because uh, we want to buy into the, you know, utopia in a, in a large sense defines kind of uh, political goals for a species or how a species conducts itself. So I don't know, that's, that's maybe a little bit of a personal thought from me, but I certainly think the universal cosmos, that concept is just so tantalizing and by thinking about it, uh, you know, it's maybe more instructive, you know, maybe its abstraction is its essential quality, right? If it, be when it becomes concrete, it becomes insufficient to us, right? Even Kant would, you know, Kant would say that, right? And that's why you said, there's always something more. There's always something more. So as we make it concrete, when we say, well, today we, you know, if we were to say, today we live in the universal cosmopolitan society, we would start pointing out the problems that we have in today's world, right? The numerous problems that there are with, uh, you know, really, really everywhere. Right? Whether you want to make it in terms of rights or uh, limited personal freedom or unjust systems of government dictatorship, whatever, you can make it in whatever terms you'd like. But once we start to define it, uh, the more it seems very impossible to us. So that's kind of my uh, my thoughts on on that. But maybe my my wrapping up thoughts. But anything you have to add? Yeah. Um... I, I would just leave it with a quote from the text. Um, quote, everyone can see that philosophy can have her belief in a millennium, but her millenarianism is not utopian, since the idea can help, though only from afar, to bring the millennium to pass. And so we don't want to remain in our, in our abstraction in such a way that maybe uh, precludes us from realizing the just constitution. But if we can somehow yeah. make it a guide to that end. Yeah, I guess, but uh, later on, we're going to see, well, uh, the more we take this idea as concrete, the more uh, problems that seem to really arise, the less we find we understood what we really meant by just constitution, I guess, in some sense. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's a uh, great place, but uh great place to wrap things up so uh is it, if let's that's leave it, it at that let's leave yeah, it at we'll, that yeah we'll leave it there yeah all right